uh, the different sort of disciplines and expertise in the room. Um, who here is a designer or a researcher? Awesome. Who does something, who's done research before or tried it? Great, okay. All right, good. So you've got some, some vague experience in it. Are you all working on, in small teams, on new products? Yeah, okay, lots of nods, great, this is good to know, okay. So, this, uh, this is for you then. Um, so we're gonna talk about what user research is and definitely what it is not, um, to try and blast some myths, uh, why you should do it. Um, Sasha is gonna give us um, some information really that, about cognitive biases and how, how we work as humans, especially when we do our research and talk to users as well. So what kind of, what might be going on in the user's mind at the same time. Uh, as you interview them. Um, we'll give you tips for doing it yourself afterwards and depending on the appetite in the room we may focus more attention on that. So um, this isn't, you know, we could teach you, we're also going to ask you to take part in some research with us at the end, but that's, that's the end. Um, this isn't a session on how to do a usability test and you're not going to come away from this with a template of questions to ask people. The reason for that is it doesn't exist and anyone who gives you that is um, not doing their best work. It's always different, people are messy, uh, this is about helping you get the skills, the confidence to try to ask better questions and get better results out of it. So what we ask is that um, during this in workshop, we invite you to participate fully in the activities. Hi there, join. Um, keep an open mind and interrogate your own ways of thinking as well. Um, so, just a little bit about us. Um, I'm Georgia Rackerson, I'm Design Research Lead at Consensus. I've been the company for a year. DevCon marks my anniversary, so it's nice to be here again. Um, and uh, I've been doing user research for about seven years now. I, uh, I've worked at a number of different e-commerce, financial, government projects, and uh, before that worked at Europe's leading usability testing company as well. Uh, at Consensus, I work across lots of different spokes, helping uh, do research with lots of different users, uh, including with Sasha. Um, and I also help train designers to do research as well. Hi, I'm Sasha Tanase. I've been working as a designer for nine years now. Uh, right now, I'm head of design at Aletheo Consensus, and my role there is to do user research, user experience design, user interface. Um, I champion all the time user research, and this is why sometimes I'm the bad cop in my team, <laughs> and I stubbornly stick to my opinions about uh, users and why they have their own rights, so that, that's me. Um, okay, so there are actually enough people to do this in pairs, which is a bit better than this. So you could just grab somebody um, just to uh, find out a little bit about them and their experience of doing research. We'll literally do this for just a couple of minutes um, afterwards. So I'm going to set a timer. There's two here, there's two there, there's two there, and you guys can make it three. That's like, sounds like perfect. <laughs> so if you just introduce each other, get yourselves to each other, you find out what they know about research. Hi,
uh, MBAs, you know, the summer program to you know, measure the social impact in, uh, of uh, social entrepreneurs in Africa. So, Built on Ethereum, yes. and then we need to integrate it to the information protocols like the compound, the fiber, and the uh, We built basically interfaces for the uh, metaverse. I know that a lot of we are experienced with research for the user space, but the research on the venture capital is more difficult. So, we have a lot of some projects on the platform building. I never went to the end to me. So right now, yeah. And uh, who is doing the interface then? Your team? No, yeah, you're in my team. So Nicola Di Marco, so uh, this is the product designer. Okay, everybody, thank you for your time, appreciate it. I'd just love to know um, if anyone would like to share any, um, any of their biggest pains doing user research or the biggest problems that they've encountered. And then what we can do, we can uh, try and focus on that towards the end of the session it, it, to tailor it to you. So has anyone got anything they're dying to know about? I think you said that you were interested in finding people to talk to, how to go find the users. Anyone else with anything else they're interested in? All of it, amazing, okay, cool. All right, so what is user research? We're not gonna go into too long about this, you've all got a sense of it, but um, I just wanna explain, um, this is Margaret Mead, she's a very famous, was a very famous anthropologist, and she famously um, wrote this, what people say, what people do, and what they say they do are entirely different things. And she discovered this by observing people in the natural environment and interviewing them separately and doing surveys. She tried loads of different methods, and this was in the 30s, um, and it was quite influential at the time, and also quite, um, uh, what's the word, Contro controversial too, because this was around the time where man was meant to be master of his mind, right? So, um, so what consumer behavior and the science around that has proven this to be the case, is that people are not very insightful about their own, about their own habits, behaviors, motivations. They need to help eliciting that out of them. And that's the job of the user interviewer. Um, so what is user research? It's, we're talking about qualitative research here. You could go and do um, big data surveys, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's usually interviewing or observing real people. Um, and what we're looking for is identifying needs, behaviors, goals, motivations, pains, all that good stuff which tells you what you should be building. Um, and understanding the why behind the what they do, right? What they do is interesting, but it's hard to make informed decisions based on that. So what we want to understand is what is the intrinsic motivation behind people's behaviors. And then the whole purpose of research is to have an action plan off the back of it, right? You come, you've seen these patterns and themes across users, and now what you're going to want to do is come up with some recommendations and actions. And we'll actually talk at the end about how you can you how you can help do that with your team as well. Um, so what user research is not, it is not about people's opinions. It is not about whether they would prefer the yellow object or the black object, right? That, it, that's kind of market research. Um, it's as well, market research is about asking uh, many people the same set of questions and actually you end up learning a little about a lot of people. The benefit of qualitative user research interviews is you will learn a lot from a small number of people. Um, and data analytics, uh, you know, site usage, um, uh, what's happening with your product, that is very interesting what data, okay? But there's two problems, firstly, in the blockchain space is that most apps or dApps or services don't have many users. Uh, uh, so if you don't have data, then how else are you gonna find out what people are doing? Um, a lot of companies are actually not intrinsic, intentionally not building in any analytics uh, products into their product off the basis that they wanna keep it uh, pure and like to make sure that the users behaviors are not being tracked and things like that by any third party like Google Analytics. 
Um, so uh, data analytics is useful, but you need like a lot of users for that to make sense. Um, otherwise, you're basically just looking at what all your development team is doing on your website. Um, and it's not something which I've, I've experienced before. Like, oh, we've had 100 users, that's everyone in the team. Um, so something you only do once you've built the thing, right? It's, this is the wrong time to be doing research. We need to be doing research at the start of the thing. Really, before you build anything, there is a, um, a bias towards action and a bias towards technology within uh, blockchain, uh, and within the ecosystem, which is, let's get building something, okay? But um, I question the value of building the wrong thing. Um, and I really like to encourage people just to at least do some research to start things off. Yeah. Um, so why is being able to interview users important to you? You've probably heard the statistic uh, somewhere between 50 and 90 percent, depending on uh, what article you read. Between 50 and 90 percent of all startups fail in their first year, right? And then the remaining lot start failing and only a small proportion last to year five. Okay, so based on that information, most people in this room are working on a failing product. I want the people just to think about that for a second, right? And like, let, let's, let's be open to this because we, we live in a world where we have to, we're cheerleaders for our product all the time. We're in our own little echo chambers in our bubbles like, yeah, it's gonna change the world. Well, we don't know that to be the case. And the way we can de-risk is doing research early. So just get some done first, right? Before we build the product and find out it's the wrong thing. Um, and, and that's the whole point, it's saving time and money by doing this. Um, it can really help align people around the problem as well that they might have. Um, and we're in this early stage of this pioneering technology um, and uh, it's certainly in the way that people and businesses interact with one another. Um, but because crypto and blockchain, the world is relatively small uh, and highly technical, it's easy for us to think that our users are just like us, right? Oh, uh, we're building a product. Who's the product for? Oh, it's for people like me. Okay, that might be true, but it's get it's a guesswork. It's guesswork until you go and find out, right? So I'm not saying that you're wrong, but maybe just go and ver verify that because um, not everybody speaks in the same language as us, uh, and I mean like technical language as well as um, nationality and, and uh, other language as well. So that's really important, and probably you don't have a dedicated user researcher on your team. Uh, there are many, most teams don't have someone like me or Sasha to come and do all the research for you. So don't just leave it until you're you know, six months down the road and then you hire your, your designer and then you get them to do some research. You do it first. I think it's a really great um, and empowering activity. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sasha to talk about some tech failures. So, how many of you are working right now on product? Well, many. How many of you have done user research for product? Not so many. <laughs> it's okay, you're not alone. Uh, many tech companies forget to do that and uh, they, they ignore user research. And this is called tunnel vision and that's like a deadly scene. Design ignores users and Users, if users feel that they are ignored by design, they, they are going to ignore the design. So, I will show you some uh, heartbreaking uh, testimonials. Never mind, I read it through here. So this is from eCrowd, they say we spend way too much time building it for ourselves and not getting feedback from prospects. It's easy to get tunnel vision. I'd recommend not going more than two or three months from the initial start to getting in the hands of product uh, prospect. So if you're working on your product and it wasn't like more than three months, it's alright, you can do it now. <laughs> And this is from Voter Type. We didn't spend enough time talking with customers, and we were rolling out features that I thought were great, but we didn't gather enough input from clients. We didn't realize it until it was too late. It's easy to get tricked into thinking your, your thing is cool. 
you have to pay attention to your customers and adapt to their needs. So probably we all have been there. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so what does bad user research look like? Okay, so the first type of bad user research is no user research. You may be familiar with this quote from Henry Ford. Got a question mark uh, there because actually the first attribution to him was in 1970, uh, this quote. So who knows if he actually did say it. Um, so the, the, I've heard this from people in blockchain as a reason not to speak to customers. Okay. Um, there's a few problems with this, right? Um, it's also like, it's used to argue that like true innovation from, comes from singularly gifted individuals who know better than anybody else, right? I'm sure we're all, we all know people who kind of behave a bit like that. Um, but the problem with the, using this quote as an argument is that this is not user research. So what he's actually talking about, if I had asked people what they wanted, we don't ask people what they want in user research. That's capturing opinions. People are very poor predictors of their future behavior, okay? So uh, this, is, this is just bad research that he's talking about doing, okay? In addition, Ford, uh, the motor car company, um, due to their lack of innovation, so, so they obviously created a great product, but then all the innovation that happened after that was on the production line to save money, to build cars cheaper. You may remember he was also apparently said that you can have any color you want except black. So what happened was Ford cars, motor share, uh, the share of, um, uh, of the market dropped from 66% in 1921 to 15% in 1927. So that's a six years, a massive drop in market share. So you can use that as a fact next time that somebody says that we don't need to speak to customers. The competition was innovating in the space, and Ford was not, and that's the reason why that happened. Um, maybe after today's workshop, you will think twice about putting this out. Okay, I look, we've all done this at some point, right? I made a thing, please give me feedback. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, so what happens? What sort of feedback do you get? Who answers it? Are there any people who are your fans? Are these people who already know what your product is? Right? You're not really, what about the people who refuse to click on it? Maybe you should find out what they think. Because also talking to detractors is really, really valuable. Um, and then this brings us on to surveys. So, most surveys are absolute garbage. I'm really sorry to explain this to you. Now there's a few reasons why this is the case. Um, they feel like they're, they're a good tool. That's because they're ubiquitous. Every company is putting them out there all the time. You always get requests to fill out a survey, right? So by frequency, it brings validity. The problem is, is that it's very easy to create a bad survey. Survey design is actually a science, right? There's statistics that goes into it. Um, in order for it to really help you, you need to think, put a lot of effort into it. But it's really easy just to throw one up. Oh, what should we ask them? What you liked, what you disliked, blah, blah, blah. Send it out, okay? Um, and I think surveys are often used in, uh, instead of user research because talking to people is scary, right? So it's like we want the survey to do the talking for us and we expect the survey also for everybody to fit into these neat boxes that we've already determined for them. But people are messy and amorphous, okay? So it's, uh, it's not as simple as that. And I'd like you just, it, it just to challenge this a little bit further is also to think about your own use of surveys. So when you get sent a survey, do you fill it out? Why do you? Why do you not? Is it because you have a particular relationship to that brand? What happens when the survey is too long? Do you abandon it halfway through? What happens when you see a question that you're not really sure what it's asking you and you don't feel that the survey is asking you the question you really wish it was asking you and then you get asked to rate something between 1 and 10 and like what's the difference between a 7 and 8? Someone's actually going to do some number crunching around that and they haven't thought about the science of it either, right? So it, they're not that useful, okay? I hope you're putting that across. Um, and also we are default to, we have uh, confidence in large sample sizes, right? So we think that, the, uh, oh, we, well, it's better than speaking to a few people, we're gonna get loads of survey responses and that will give us confidence about the answers that are there. So firstly, if you're, uh, how, do you get large um, responses? I have a big question around that, put out loads of surveys where you get like 15 responses, 
Does it really help you make decisions? There's a big question around that. And also, um, if, uh, uh, let me just see, um, it's only true that they are give you more certainty if you're doing a robust recruitment method to recruit a very large group of representative people of your users and then randomly selecting from them. That's the way to have accuracy in large data. No one does that when they send out surveys. They just blast their customer base um, and hope that some people um, re reply. So um, we guarantee, Sasha and I will put, like, put money on it, that if you go and speak and have deep interviews with five people, you will learn a lot more than you will surveying and getting a response from 20 people. I promise. Okay. Um, so another type of bad user research is doing it with those who are easiest to access. The people who love us, they're great, they're like our cheerleaders, they want us to do really, really well, right? The problem with this is that they're probably too close to the product, they may speak the same language as us in terms of the, the terminology that we use for things, they probably have an idea of who you are and they want you to do well. So they're probably not going to be very honest about it, okay? And, 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 but there is, a, there is a use case for doing this. Practice your interview with them. They're great people to practice questions with. So don't feel scared to do it. It's just these aren't your users, okay? These, this is just other people's opinions as well. Um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to hand over to Sasha. She's going to talk about some brain hacking. Yeah, so what we're about to touch now is some sort of brain hacking. We will get to learn how uh, our brain's vulnerabilities and how to turn them into opportunities and into to put them onto our advantage. So um, I will run you through some cognitive biases and feel free to raise your hand if you spot them and you have experienced them. So, what are cognitive biases? They are mental shortcuts our brain takes. This means that they are unconditioned and we can't avoid them. But what we can do is learn how to spot them by knowing more about this matter. And because cognitive biases are loving us all, uh, also researchers are uh, their victims. So, uh, why it's so important to know about them is because as researchers, we, we might spoil our, uh, our work. So let's, let me give you an example. You are doing uh, research, you have some assumptions, you are super, like, you, you're super, super thinking that that's the true assumption. And because you want to really probe that, you are formulating your questions like, uh, you know, uh, just to probe them. So you are influencing and biasing your user by articulating uh, not very well the questions. So, um, but not only researchers are the only ones affected by biases. Users are humans too. So <laughs> there, you have to bear that in mind. And when you do user interviews, don't take their words like for granted, just try to read between the lines. So we'll start with uh, the response bias, uh, and I'm quite curious how many of you have experienced it. Uh, I had it myself many times. So uh, the response bias is it's caused by the way we collect data, this means that you can bias your entire research by the way you articulate the questions. Sometimes this happens when the development team conducts the research. It's very hard to step away, be objective, especially if the responses you're getting are not what you want to hear. Have you exper experienced it? Have you went through that? How many? Put your hands up. Okay. Very sincere crowd, I love it. So why do you specifically say the development team conducts the research? Like everyone who works on the product, this is the development yeah, okay. team. I'm not <laughs> showing... Yeah, it's not single yeah. developers, it's just yeah, yeah, in the yeah. development of the product. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so getting to our next bad boy. This is the desire for harmony in a group which results in a dysfunctional decision making. We want to minimize conflict and reach consensus, so we might suppress opposing viewpoints and isolate our team from outside influences. So we love our product so much, so we don't want to hear anything like outside of it. Uh, confirmation bias. This is the tendency to search for, or interpret, focus, and remember information in, in the way that confirms our beliefs. So this happens when you do user research and, I don't know, you only hear the answers you want to hear. So even though 95% of the users tell you something else, you only want to hear the 5%, so you get some super biased information. That, that happened uh, to me at Aletio when we were working on our uh, blockchain explorer. We were so convinced that our core users were the uh, power users. So we only wanted to hear that. Uh, course of knowledge effect. When better informed people find it extremely difficult to think about problems from the perspective of lesser informed people. This is when we don't really use, we, we, we use the terminology and think that everybody should really understand about it. Think of it, you're, you're working in blockchain, right? And you talk to everyone with uh, the terminology and expect them to really know what you're saying but it's not all right. You don't have to make your user feel dumb. Don't challenge your user. Even if they are an expert, just <laughs> yeah. use plain language. Uh, social desirability bias. Isn't this like one of the biggest issues right now? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is actually very, you can encounter it all the time in, when you're doing research. No, but I mean specifically in, in blockchain, I mean if you look yeah. at UX right now, you go through like all the UX and then if you have a user who has never heard of blockchain, and you confront them with like all the apps and onboarding, like, yeah, it's totally you're ridiculous. They you're don't understand anything, which is totally good. Cool, to me it makes totally sense. But yeah, then it's a new user, they have no clue what they're talking about. Yeah, uh, and it's all right not to know. <laughs> Yeah, but I think that's one of the biggest challenges for us in blockchain is yeah. to have people that know to what blockchain is. Actually, onboard them and make them successful. Yeah, and I think this is our uh, role to do education. Uh, and social desirability bias. This is about uh, users you interview might give you the answers they think you'd like to hear over their true beliefs because they want to plead you. So. This always happens to me, and in order to avoid it, when I do a user interview, I tell them, I never worked on this design, don't worry about it. But the people who are uh, working on this are not part of the research. So you, you ease them in, so you make them uh, feel more comfortable, to be honest. Uh, Hawthorne effect. This is when people know they are being observed, they might change their behavior, they might think they are being tested in an interview instead of just listened to. So you, a tip for this could be uh, to tell them all the time and remind them every now and then during the interview, you're not tested, only the product is tested. And there, there, once, uh, there once happened to me when I was uh, testing uh, with a user, he didn't know what an ABI code was and he just I don't know, started to be very reluctant to answer to my questions and I didn't want him to feel bad. Yeah, so you can avoid that. Uh, IKEA, in fact, I think all the designers and the development team is affected by this. Uh, we place a high value on products we created or worked hard for. Let your users do something as part of the onboarding process, not too hard but rewarding so they can connect with your product. But let's stick to the we place a high value on products we created. Uh, 
every time you do research or you get feedback, because you love so much your uh, product, you'll, you'll tend to not hear what people are telling you. And But there's also a, a reverse type of thing. Um, actually, you can um, make it make this bias as an advantage. As a researcher or a designer, you're the designated messenger for bad news. So you get the bad feedback and you have to send, tell it to your uh, development team. And in order for them to feel not as if, okay, I, I went somewhere, I have invented this, this is magic, they're all left out, you, you um, invite them to take part in the user interviews whenever they can or witness everything that, uh, that's happening because UX has to be transparent. We love transparency in blockchain, right? So we have to make all the processes transparent. And, uh, well, this is about the fact that everyone can do user research. It's a skill that you can uh, learn you're not born with it, uh, and you only have to get in the mindset of a user researcher. And that means that you have to be a detective. Think of it, you're the Sherlock Holmes of your product. So you have to pay attention to all the details, dig deep, ask all the WH questions you think you need to in order to get all the answers and the insights. Uh, also think that you have to be a psychologist, uh, you, you have to understand why, how people are working and why are they doing that and just try to see what tickles them and just, yeah. Uh, and also you have to be uh, like on a safari, you have to observe people but not to be an active observer. Just try to take a step back, not to influence them with your opinions, your biases. It's, it's not a heavy petting zoo, so it's just a safari. And I'll hand it back to um, Okay, so uh, the first thing that we're going to do, and this is when we're going to start getting into activities now, so I hope you've all had your coffee and woken up. Um, so, uh, what we do at the start of any research is stating our assumptions, and this is a really valuable thing to do uh, with your team. So, um, the, assum the assumptions are basically what do we think we're going to find out when we start interviewing people? That's what we're trying to, that's what we're going to put down. Okay? Um, they don't have to be right, you, you don't know the answer to these things, but they're a bunch, they're a guess. Like, I think probably this will happen. All right? I think X because Y. It's really good to do this as a whole team exercise, so using that IKEA effect again, get people involved early, then they will feel heard and care about the outcome as well. Um, and then also, when you do it as a team exercise, you start surfacing where there is disagreement, where there are conflicting views about uh, beliefs that, the that people in the company have. Those are great places to focus the research on. So if you've got a debate in your organization about which way should we go with this particular product feature or whatever, then interviewing people can help um, you know, solve that question, really. Um, so we state it like this, I think X because X, Y. Um, and it's fine not to agree about them. So just a basic example. Um, and Sasha's gonna hand out some things to you all as well. So an example research question, right? So let's say you're building a decentralized exchange. Uh, where's the gap in decentralized exchanges now, which could be an opportunity for us, right? Quite straightforward. Um, so an assumption might look like this. I think what's missing is a mobile app, because if users can access the DEX on the go, this will lead to more usage and more liquidity on the exchange. Okay, so Sasha's bringing out um, some uh, things here. We need to get into groups of three. So if you could organize yourselves in groups of three, please. Yeah. Sorry, I was waiting for a while, but that's the expense. You're a two. It's okay. Two's okay. Uh, 
So um, we're just going to spend probably only about 10 minutes on this activity and I want you just to work together to state what your assumptions are about the thing I've put in front of you, okay? So in your group you should all have the same thing, yeah? You've all got the same question, right? Yeah. Okay. So have a look at the research question and just write your assumptions down. You don't have to agree with each other, just work them out, okay? So try to come up with five at least and state the because as well, right? So what we're thinking is, if we were going to interview someone about this, what would we expect to find out?
competition, imagining like what you do. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's like you're presenting, this is the question of what's the experience like somebody traveling to another country, right? And you're like, product team, you're trying to come up with this new cool way to help people make this a better experience, right? Or for, to make this a better experience for people. So if you're going to ask people, like, say, like, pick a few people here in Derry, what do you think would be here from them about their experience? And it could be from your own personal experience that you're like, oh, well, I have this issue. I bet everyone else has the same issue as well. So that's a good assumption to have. Okay, yeah, we, we wear customers' shoes. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so, so wear the customers' shoes. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a really good question. Um, yes. It should. I know, but it needs to. I mean, part of it. If you bring all your assumptions are about solutions, you can not be able to validate it, right? Because the research is not that. And the needs problem of the pain to the user of the problem. So you need to put the exam. What is the problem? Is that a case of pain? Exactly. And then you come to solutions. Because you have the brain noise as you research. As you speak to people, you're like, oh my god, why did I not see this before? It feels like magic just happens when this solution shines in front of you. Yeah, problems with the problem. 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 Yeah, but then when you, when you go to music, all of you find that how you can get there, how you get there. Yeah, and, and, and here it's a right way once you buy the Wi-Fi. But otherwise you have to download all, uh, all these offline maps. Yeah, like you, you always feel like you're sort of like disconnected and you want to stay. It's all wrong. Are you right? Yeah. Transportation. The thing is, it would be how we maybe create subcategories. Which one do you think? Find the right transportation. Uh, so, different <laughs> country, language, translation, here, when you, when you try to do it something, you, you have to use the steps on the table. You the I don't know if you try it or and it's a mess. So it's impossible. And the translation of what they I mean, this doesn't make sense at all. So you can do a point of order. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Getting the directions to us. So, so yeah. I think that's a, a challenge that the international people face when they come to Japan. Uh, but I was more focused on when they come, when those travelers come to Japan for what conference. There must be some sort of powers to come to this conference, which is reaching out to potential customers, reaching out their partners. So they like to know within the conference. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah within the conference. You know, who are the other, you know, what do we need to Yeah, that's good. Yeah, what yeah. is it? Network, yes, yeah, yeah. How do you like to work in that one? I don't know. 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 I don't Okay, last minute, last assumption. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. And maybe knowing where to stay to face the different budgets, because <laughs> I don't know about you, but staying at the Highlands uh, was uh, a bit expensive. Yeah, I'm here because of our budget. Budget is the thing. Budget, budget, budget. budget. Yeah, how much it costs to, you know, uh, food and travel in Japan. So, okay, all right, everybody, you can wrap up now. That'll be good. <laughs> You've all got some assumptions written down, which is brilliant. So we're going to go through now um, sort of the anatomy of an interview, all right? Um, you will have in front of you some stickers. So, there's usually three roles in an interview, a facilitator, a user, and an, and an observer. The mm -hmm. observer is really useful as the person who can take notes mm -hmm. for the facilitator. The observer doesn't talk during it. It's important not to have a three-way conversation. You need one-to-one -one conversation between the user and the facilitator. Right. Yeah. So, you, you probably guessed by now, you need to assign it yourselves with the stickers so um, do that now quickly just to stick them on you who's going to be a facilitator who's going to be a user who's going to be an observer all right i'm the user okay no no because i mean you can you can be a user yeah okay good right 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 okay so um so i'm going to talk through some good versus bad interview questions I, we, right, okay, it's not a surprise, you're going to be doing some interviewing in a minute, all right? You have not prepared for this, so it's going to be uncomfortable and okay. awkward. That's fine, okay? It's just, it's just getting a little bit of the experience of it, okay? So, um, we've got handouts, which we're going to hand out in a minute, which have all of this stuff on, like cheat sheets for how to interview people, what good questions are and bad questions. So, good questions, they're open-ended. They're things like, tell me about, describe a time, Tell me more about this thing, okay? Storytelling is quite good, like walk me through the last time you did X from when you started to the end. But you need to be following up with why. Why was that? How come? Tell me more about that, right? These are all very like curious questions that allow the user to answer from their own experience without really leading them, right? You're not telling them what you want to hear, they're very much like, you tell me, right? And then when you hear something that's particularly interesting, you can ask why about that particular thing. So on the flip side, bad questions are closed. They end with yes or no. Um, future casting, everyone is dying to ask this question, would you pay for this, right? You can ask this question if you want, right? But the answer you get will not reflect reality. People are very poor predictors of their future behavior, okay? This is, you need quite advanced market research to, to work out what people are gonna pay for your product and how they'll pay for it, uh, and whether they will pay for it. Um, and also, the, the best thing to do is to understand the pain. So if you actually really want to find out if someone's gonna pay for something, try and find an analogous situation where they've, they've moved from a free product to a paid product in the past. What made them move? You know, what, what was enough to incentivize them to start paying for something? When you can understand their past behavior, then you can start predicting their future behavior. But don't rely on them to tell you because they will not uh, necessarily get it right, okay? Um, and leading questions, so we talked about this already quite a bit. They're questions which suggest to the user what you have in mind, right? And a very simple uh, um, uh, example of this, right, is do you like that? Do you like that is, um, is a leading question, okay? Uh, it's also a closed question, so it ends with a yes or a no. Uh, and, it's, and it suggests to the user that they should like it, right? Then there are some varying degrees of improving on this question until you get to a really good one. So this is kind of a bit weird. Do you like that or not? You're starting to add balance in there, like there's two ways it could go. And that this is like, really anal. do you like that or not like that you've probably seen survey questions phrased like this trying to not lead the user and be balanced but the best question is this what do you think of that allow them to use their language to describe what it is that they're experiencing okay um, so th this is the way to get really good stuff out of people and yeah sure because you just made it like instead of like uh, Instead of like, do you use nothing? 
So you give the option to read it positive and negative. But what if you specifically want to have like positive ones? Because if somebody's like always giving like negative things, yes. you also want them to focus on the positive, would you still use stink? Good, good question. So you can do that uh, later on. So the idea is that you, you, you start quite broad, yeah. right? Um, get information from them and then start going in. So a good question might be, what was your experience of that? What did you think of that? Okay, and then they start going negative, 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 negative. Was there anything you liked about that? Yeah, well, what did you like about that? That's perfectly reasonable. But it's just best to start allowing them yeah, to tell you. Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, we need to be grateful for their time and honest with the purpose of the research. Research is not the same as selling your product. And the amount of calls I've been on where the product team is trying to pitch at the same time as doing user testing, these are not compatible at all, right? When you're pitching to a client, they want you to do the talking. They're not going to be honest about their experiences to you. Why would they do that? Keep these things separate. Make sure they know it's this customer, you're not selling them anything, you want their feedback, their, um, their responses to the questions that you've got. Um, you need to be friendly, but not friends. When we're friends with people, and we've all experienced this, um, uh, I love having great chats with my friends, right? But this is, comes to the social desirability bias, that you have a wonderful chat, you'll all feel good at the end but you probably are not being totally truthful. So, it's about creating a bit of space to allow honesty to be there, as opposed to just being chummy and agreeing with everything everyone says all the time. Let them do the talking as much as possible. If it starts slowing down, you know, you're like, uh-huh, okay, mm -hmm. those kind of prompts. Uh, avoid influencing them, and like we said before, don't assume technical knowledge. Um, technical knowledge. Use plain language where you can. That's quite important. So um, we're actually going to demonstrate what a user research interview might feel like. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sasha because she's going to interview me. Yeah, so we're going to do a playing. Uh, so I will be the researcher. I'm researching a fitness app. And Georgia is my uh, user that I'm going to interview. I will start by asking her broad questions about her, just to ease her in and find out about a bit about her context. Uh, then I will start to ask her um, more questions about um, um, fitness, broad questions, to see what comes out. I will listen and pick out uh, some of the things she says and then start uh, getting narrower and asking her more granular questions about uh, the fitness app because this is my end goal but I don't want to start directly by asking her, her that because I might not uh, get the so many insights that she, she might give me uh, for I'm biasing her uh, somehow she will think that oh I'm only interested in fitness I don't want to know anything about her or her life or anything like that so she will stick only to that subject. So, okay. Uh, hi, Georgia. Thank you for accepting my invitation for the interview. I am Sasha, I am a design researcher, and I would love you to tell me a bit about yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm going to pretend I'm not me. I'm Georgia. Uh, I work in, um, travel, in travel insurance. Uh, I live in London. I've got a husband and a cat. Okay, cat, nice. Uh, but what do you do when you're not working? Um, so I, well, when well, I work from home, so I try to get out and about as much as possible so I'm not lazy at home. Um, I do a lot of reading, I also do a lot of walking, I hang out with friends, and I also go do yoga as well sometimes. So now she has mentioned yoga, so I will pick on that. I heard, so you mentioned yoga. Well, can you tell me more about that? Um, yeah, I go to um, uh, a place called Yoga Space London. It's uh, it's not very far from my home, and um, I kind of uh, I go there maybe once or twice a week. And I, I like I buy I book the sessions online. I just like buy a whole bulk of tokens, and then I can book whatever sessions I want. 
So you, you're using a website for that uh, London yoga studio you mentioned. What, what do you like about the website? Um, I really love, uh, actually the thing I really like about it is that I can cancel the sessions with like no, hardly any notice, just like two hours before, because like work gets in the way a lot and uh, I like people just dump meetings in my calendar so I often have to move move my exercise sessions around it. Okay, and now I'm getting narrower. Um, and where else do you do yoga? Uh, I don't do yoga anywhere else, only at the studio. Why is that? Um, I've tried doing it at home, but um, I can't really, to be honest, I don't, I'm not sure I've got the space in the house and also it's just hard to get motivated. So you see, I get many pain points from her. She, she doesn't have space, but I'm not interested because I do a fitness app. But she also said she doesn't get motivated. So now I'm picking on that. And um, have you explored any ways to get more motivation? Um, so have I done that before? Uh, yeah, I've used some like fitness apps before, but um, to be honest, I just end up stop. I just don't really stick with them. And it's very good to ask many whys. Try to find everything about what they say. Now I'm, I'll ask her why. Why did you stop using that? Um, to be honest, I've got like not a very modern phone and all the apps are just too large. So I just end up deleting them. So boom, I really find what's her culprit. So, yeah. <laughs> So, so from that, starting to understand like some pains and potential opportunities as well. Okay, so maybe we should make our app really lightweight so that people who don't have loads of room on their phone, it doesn't get automatically deleted, which is what Apple does now. Um, so um, just some facilitated tips of the trade, actually. Um, we're going to share these with you. So the five whys, this is root cause analysis. Uh, you may be familiar with it. It comes from manufacturing industry I think uh, and uh, the, the idea is oh something came off the production line that's got a fault why is that we made um, a piece of machinery wasn't working correctly why is that management had changed why is that blah 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 so by asking why many times you start to get to the real reason now obviously you're not going to ask the user why five times okay uh, and you don't want to sound like a robot, it's meant to be a sort of conversation. But maybe once or twice, is, we'll get to the real reason. If you remember that users don't have this why always there at their mind, at, at this top level, of, it's not um, readily accessible. So you have to ask it. They're not going to necessarily tell you the reason why. Um, next one is the echo. So, um, you know, then you can encourage them to say more. If perhaps they've said something you're not really sure, you don't really understand, you can just kind of repeat it back to them and they'll hopefully say some more. Kind of on a similar thread, the boomerang. So this is really good in user testing. If someone goes, they're, they're trying out your app and they're like, well, if I click this, is it going to take me to a confirmation page? And you know, they're asking you a question, so your automatic response is to answer. Right? Don't answer the question, just ask it back. What do you think will happen when you press that button? Then they will explain, okay? So just so, like, any questions that come back at you, throw it back at them. Um, silence. I'm really bad at this, as you can probably tell. I like talking and filling in awkward silences. But um, the more silence you can give, the more other people will do that. So the user may well say something, that extra little nugget, and there are many times in user research interviews I've done where I just, I use a technique where I'll just have my notebook in front of me, they've, they've said something, they've paused, and I don't just go straight to the next question, it sounds like there's something else there, so I'll just write some notes, and just look busy, and then they just continue talking, and some real wisdom can come out there, which is, really exciting that that does work. And then, this is the question, right, about, um, uh, you know, when you're, when you're just not getting what you need out of them, right, you can use the Colombo method. 
All right, so, right, okay, so would you ever use, like, what, what about these fitness apps? You know, right, just, like, get it out of them right at the end, because you, the purpose of the research interview is to have some insights, okay? If it's not going anywhere, that they're, they're not seeming to get the questions that you're asking, you can ask a more direct question, but just maybe try the other techniques first before you get here, definitely. So, um, Sasha has given you copies of all of this stuff um, that you can take away with you. Um, and uses your cheat sheets for when you're running user research interviews. Um, but so you're listening for the reason behind the answer, not just the answer that they give you. Uh, habits, behaviors, issues, annoyances, opportunities, all of that stuff is real gold dust. And in the session that we're about to do now in the workshop, um, we're going to interview one user, right? But really you would do more than one user, so then you're looking for themes and patterns across those users. I will uh, we'll talk about um, how many users in a little bit later on. Um, so I know there's some newcomers here. Hello. Um, you've missed out on the first activity, but that's fine. What I would suggest is that you join a group and be an observer in what's going to happen in the next bit, okay? So let's try it out. Users, you've got your user stickers on, yeah? Okay, I want you to abandon, aban you guys haven't got your stickers on. Yeah. And please, put, put it on, put it on. Because right, right, right. you're going to be moving around, so it's easy for people to identify. So you're not going to be in your groups, right? The user, the user from each group, abandon your, um, you abandon, yeah, abandon ship. You don't need your assumptions with you. Move to another group, okay? So the users are going to move around. Yes, I'm here as a Welcome. Great. So the facilitators. So, uh, so facilitators, you're going to do some question asking. I haven't prepared you with questions. It's not going to be easy, right? This, this is just uh, an experience of speaking to somebody who probably has not seen the topic that you're going to ask them questions about, right? Yeah, maybe hide that. Um, okay, so just go ahead. Let's do it for 10 minutes. Remember, st start with those broad questions, get to know them, and start narrowing in on what you want to find out. Observers, please listen carefully and note where Assumptions are proved correct or wrong through the internet. Okay. Hey, I'm Daniel. Uh, I do security audits. I travel from time to time to conferences. Yeah. I do enjoy the bus. It's hard to find out the guy who's top of the field. But I can do it for a long time. So it's not only one guy. 
So in this we have a conference and you can find people that are using the whole world. So it's like all year, the parks, everything is happening in the So wherever you go, you find people. Uh, it's a different uh, atmosphere uh, where we're going to go. Uh, 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 uh,
Okay, everybody, thank you. Thank you for um, so willingly getting into the roles. I really appreciate it. That's nice. Um, so we were originally going to do this so that we would all get back into original groups, but I don't have, know whether it's too necessary. I'd love the people, I'd love to go around each group, but maybe we'll just share the experience. I'm interested, first of all, for each team, did you discover whether any of your assumptions were true or not? What about you guys over here? And it, or was it all surprising? Um, okay, so our research question was about the Yeah, that would be. Okay, so um, our research question was about the experience of conference attendees trying to meet other people at DEFCON and how to make this experience better. So we assume that um, well, people here are a bit introverted and they uh, come here with their own interests so they can be a bit into their heads and it would help if we help them um, organize a bit, organize a workshop for example, um, <coughs> give them a mutual goal in some other way and one, one uh, funny thing that we came up with is organizing some sort of speed dating for people. Mm. But you know, just use a space with a given protocol, how to... Did you find that out in the interview? Yeah, so I feel like we're getting there. I mean, yeah. No. <laughs> 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 Somehow, somehow. No right. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we are very close to reaching this conclusion, I feel like. Okay, okay. great, all right. So, may I, like, as a facilitator, I mean, observer. As, a, sorry, as an observer, <laughs> um, there were, like, a lot of assumptions that we wrote down, and especially the people, like, the reasoning behind it. And um, we just discussed this, and uh, you felt that, like, we touched most of them. Uh, but for me, as an observer, I think we touched only two of the six. Mm -hmm. And which no, so for example, the, the speed dating, I mean, uh, give it also your re reaction, you're like, what did we like, did didn't notice? Did it notice, notice that we was like you? So um, I think that um, also if you're asking questions, you should really keep in mind your assumptions and see if you can try to uh, validate them. Exactly, um, and this is why it's helpful not to do it by yourself, it's to have an observer yeah, to keep an eye, because yeah. you need that, that person who's not trying to store the information in their head and also ask not leading yeah. questions, it can be quite yeah. challenging to do it, yeah. 
And so, so, but in general, I think like there were a lot of open questions, so it's really good. Yeah. But in the end, uh, to say like, okay, did we check our assumptions? I don't think we checked our assumptions. And, yeah. it was a and, good discussion. and look, you didn't write a dis you know normally you would write a discussion guide, which is going to have the questions in it that yeah, will sure. help help address the assumptions, sure. right? Yeah. I've just landed this on you cold, so it's not surprising <laughs> that you've got it right. Um, but well done. Well done. Too. Okay. Yeah. So it's um, basically my handwriting that was like totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, what about the team back there? Did you have the same question, the same research question about DEF COM attendees? Yeah, and the uh, people. Yeah, okay. And uh, were any of the assumptions right? Uh, I, uh, we, we didn't quite get to uh, all the assumptions because I think we did realize that as we were writing our assumptions, we should also be sharing those assumptions so that then. No, no, no. Actually, like, no, it's what the assumptions are that the group came up with. Do you mean sharing them within your group? Yeah. I see. Right. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. Yeah. So, I think, like, personally, my assumptions, a lot of them, some of them were met, some of them were actually directly challenged. Obviously, I was there on a server. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it's quite. And, and that's good, right? But I mean, obviously, you wouldn't then just take the information from one user. You would do this across many. And as you start to hear the same things, that raises the confidence uh, very high. Yeah. And what about over there in, in the back? Um, so what was interesting. Uh, our research question was about how the, uh, the buying experience of that company is. And like one big assumption which we didn't even write down is that everyone bought the ticket just. Like uh, here's the way. Let's let's start the, like just through the ticket page. Uh, but our user actually bought the ticket from uh, another person, uh, uh -huh. so from a sponsor that wanted to cover his sponsor fee by selling some of these tickets. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is an example of getting out of your bubble, right? right? Yes. This is where we think everyone's had the same experience as us, but we can be directly challenged by doing this kind of thing. Yeah. So the assumption we brought down were we. Uh, Good fit for that user, but still it was interesting to find out. We found out a lot of other things, but yeah. Great, okay. And, and over here in this team? Yeah, so I mean. Something. What was your research question? I think you had a different one. So, the question was what is the experience like for someone traveling to another country for a world conference and what might make that experience better? So, I mean, first of all, something we have experienced is that. Asking open-ended question is very challenging, uh, especially if you don't have the experience. You will tend to ask. Uh, Do you? Would you? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Are you? Closed, closed or leading, leading yeah. questions. So it's, it needs. It seems like a, a, a lot of practice uh, yeah. experience. And also, I I found like going with the assumption also not straightforward because the user could also steal the conversation. Because there's, it's like a, there's a human connection here. Like you have some assumption, but the user could deviate. So keeping the conversation in the control and aligned with the assumption, also I found it a bit. Yeah, that, that exactly. Maybe because there's no experience. I mean, we, yeah. I mean, you you've come not prepared at all to this interview, right? So in in real life, there would be some preparation for this. You'd have a kind of a script of questions. But also, you do have to be flexible enough to go off script because you know it's, if the user's telling you something absolutely fascinating, it's, it's, I mean, follow that, you know, go down that rabbit hole. It's yeah. worth it's worth doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's practice. I mean, and you practice with people you know. Uh, and the last point in terms of assumption hit rate, I would say we were like 50 percent. Oh wow. We were 50 percent like correct about our assumption. 50 percent we revealed that the user has different. Hmm. Uh, different thoughts and different opinions about it. Mm -hmm. So um, we were not like completely... Or, but it's all right not to be completely... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's totally fine yeah. for them to it be wrong. It must be not, it must be half of it like, or maybe part of it mm -hmm. should, should not be... But, yeah. mm -hmm. um, so I think we've, has anyone got any particular, yeah, you've got questions. Yeah, so, so uh, um, I think that a nice example with us was one of the questions uh, was like, okay, um, what do you think would help you meet more people? Uh, which is like a good sort of like open and question. It's a bit scared, but in the right direction. And then directly thereafter was like the bias. Instead of like answering the question, it was like the bias. For example, do you feel the workshops are helping? So and yeah. then so directly you're feeding like, him. yeah, you're feeding him basically. Okay, how do you feel about workshops? Mm -hmm. So and I think that's important. Like if you sort of like ask a question, 
and there's like this silence, it might be because the other person is thinking, so just like, okay, step back, I have, to, I have no time to think, and then, yeah. like, and if that doesn't work. That's the Colombo question at the end, right? Yeah, so, sure. what about workshops? Do they yeah. help you, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. when you're like trying to find this out, but to, to do it, you know, give, try the other options first, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah but I think so my main point is like, be patient also in the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm curious, based on your experience, uh, how, how do you analyze the, what, what you get here? So are you transcribing the interviews in this case? Yeah, also, I mean, so the, the observer should take all the notes. I also take notes as a facilitator because it helps me kind of process mm -hmm. parts of the interview too. Like I might like underline something, I'll like come back to that, things yeah. like that. Um, you can then, we'll talk about analysis in a minute. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's a matter of plotting your insights across your users, right? So any kind of matrix, like a spreadsheet is good for this, but then also we'll talk about this. If you're, we have distributed teams, so if you wanna collaborate, things like Mural is great for that as well, right? So thinking about where everybody can see all the information, especially if more than one person is doing the interviews, right? Being able to put it all in one place. And actually, getting the insights into that thing is the long. It takes the longest. Coming to the conclusion can be pretty quick. When you see it all there, it's sometimes it's like oh, it's a light bulb moment. Uh, uh, yeah. Is it an advantage to to record the conversation? Yes, it is. We'll talk. We'll talk about that in a minute. So let's just. I just want to hear from the users what your experience was like, and then we'll ask, ask questions about how to do about this. Uh, so what was it like as a user? So, all right. I mean, uh, I am a user researcher, so I could I could see the some uh, pitfalls. Yeah, it's still I think it was I was not led by by the facilitator in at any moment. Maybe with this specific question and uh, some close questions also were were there. But in in general, I think it was a good interview. Mm -hmm. Just to. to Keep in mind that the guy, I guess, that yeah, sure. we, yeah. you didn't have the time yeah, to, exactly. to create one. So. Mm. What about you, user? <laughs> I think uh, I had a little bit of artificial perspective because I'm in this session. And I actually, I didn't fully process what was happening. I thought that they had the same topic that we had. <laughs> yeah. And so I was waiting to get those questions. Okay, yeah, yeah. Which maybe is an insight about real users' experiences. They come with opinions sometimes. Yeah. And they think they know what you're going to ask them and they're excited to talk about it. Uh -huh. And then this is like a completely different <laughs> conversation than they thought. <laughs> That's the purpose of mixing everybody up on this. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could tell that you were like, and making conversation, just kind of waiting for us to get into the topic. But She's already exactly. deep in the topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, okay. Uh, any other insights from users? Uh, what, what was the experience like? Okay. No? Okay. Over there? The user? Um, yeah, I was also surprised. I was ready for the question. Yeah. Okay. Because was telling it was more technically like how I felt about it. Okay, great. So, um, uh, we hear um, a lot from people that they want a template on how to do user research, right? And it feels a more personal and scientific because it's dealing with real people, people are messy. Um, so often companies, and I've worked in some of these companies as well, they cling to tools and software and user testing platforms hoping that if they use the right tool, then they will get the right results out of their research, right? And there are loads of platforms and tools out there for doing this stuff. Um, companies are just building them on demand, right? But user research doesn't need software to be done effectively. Sorry to tell everybody here that that's the case. So over time, in my experience, my toolkit has diminished a lot. So I used to use lots of these platforms and stuff, but now it's just quite simple. So I'm gonna talk about how we do research at Consensus, and I think maybe we could just make this an opportunity for questions and answers, right, as we go through, right? So you might want some tips or, or ask for more information on it as we do. Um, and so, you know, if you can get the interview part right, then you really don't need to rely on any of the other tools and software, because, you know, you can use, you can use a user testing platform, but if you ask the wrong questions, 
then you get garbage out. So it's about being able to do the interviews well is the first important bit. It's also the scariest bit and the hardest bit. So that's what people like to avoid and hope that the software does it for them. So we'll just show you how we do it here. Um, so this first of all is about who to talk to and where to find these people. We get this question all the time. You, there really need to be people outside of your work or your bubble. Um, being totally honest, uh, Consensus is a really big company and there are still some projects who only test with other people in Consensus, right? These are not our end users. Or they might be, but how could they possibly be all of the users, you know? That's a pretty niche audience that you're building for. Um, so finding people to interview is really important. So for example, say you're building a product for DAP developers, like recruiting those people at a conference like this is a really great thing to do. Uh, it's a good way to do it because probably they're already in, you know, close to your target user and you have a conversation with them to establish whether they are really what the right kind of person. Um, and then uh, you, do, uh, you don't do the interview at the conference. People are not in the mindset for taking part in user research. They'll say, oh, yeah, I guess, and then they won't turn up for the thing because there'll be something else more important that they want to do, right? So just get the contacts, make the connection, and then do follow on with it afterwards. We use, uh, and we're not paid but to promote them, but I love them, respondent.io, also userinterviews.com. You create the screener, you specify the type of user that you want, they go and find those people, present them to you in a list with how qualified they are. You can check their credentials, check them out on LinkedIn, they're real people. Uh, you can message them to ask them clarifying questions, and it's a scheduling tool for all your sessions as well, right? So, and they process the payments as well for the user. So um, this is indispensable. Well, I've successfully used this to find space enthusiasts in Kenya, um, soft commodities traders in Brazil, um, DAP developers, um, people who use MakerDAO, right? You can find these people in these platforms. So give them a try. It's also free. To, to just launch a product, project. You don't pay for anybody until they've completed it. So it's even, you can just test to see whether you can find the types of people that you're interested in talking to on it. Just give it a go. So I really, really recommend that. Um, snowball recruiting is a method where, okay, you found that perfect, the perfect user, ask them at the end, who else should I go and talk to? Get them to do the recruitment for you, right? So just passing, uh, handling that on. Um, and pay them for their time. There's two benefits to this, right? Some people say, oh, well, then they're not really interested in like giving feedback and stuff. Absolutely, that's exactly what you want. You want somebody objective who doesn't care about your project, right? They need to just, be, it um, establishes the terms of a relationship, right? This is a transaction between your, you're sharing your knowledge and I'm asking you questions. In addition, paying them means they will probably turn up. This is the biggest pain in the ass for a researcher, for your research participants to not turn up. You can't just magic another one out of the air for that hour slot. Like you've got your observers lined up, you know, you may have booked a meeting room somewhere as well for it, right? So paying them like 50 quid or $50 for an hour of their time is well, well worth it. Uh, yeah, go on. So uh, one of the sessions here, we had like uh, previous sessions, there was also this, this sort of like bounty. And the bounty was like, uh, I think it was like five US dollar or something. Yeah. Uh, and then you get into the discussion like, is that worth my time? Uh -huh. uh, so, um, and I've noticed like sometimes, that with, especially with like giving gift cards and things like this, or paying people the thing, that they don't value this enough for being there for their time. Yeah, exactly. And that is usually an issue, so. It, it, yeah, um, five dollars. No, it's absolutely not enough money. Sorry. No, of course, yeah. I, I agree. But, uh, but still, I mean, uh, even if someone would offer me like $500, I might even not do it. I mean, that's, Google, that, Google gave me like free laptops. I said, no, sorry, I don't have time for this. Then, then, so but that's, that's just a failure. That's just uh, the reality of some people, right? You can't necessarily access every single person. Mm -hmm. So understanding what the incentive is that was going to attract that person is really important. I've done research with like, CEOs of major big or corporations, they don't want money, they want a charity donation in their name. Okay, so you need to think about what the alternatives are. Um, be aware, if you use bounties, then you're only gonna get users, like literally the bounties platform, you're only gonna get people who use the bounties platform, right? So it's quite small, um, and five, 
you know, five dollars is not a, a lot of money yeah. really for that. Yeah. So I feel like this is something that varies um, in B two B versus B two C. Yes, right? it does. So I have more background in, the, in B two B, like before I, I, I got my current job. But um, in, in B two B, I find that people are more interested in, in doing these customer development interview sessions because they want to learn about the industry as well and like get some of the latest stuff. Um, yeah. Training, whereas it's really annoying um, because. Uh, so, so when I've done B2B interviews, uh, I sort of have phrased it like, I want you to need your expert opinion, right? Okay. People love being heard, and they want to be considered that, you know, the industry is somehow going to react to their world, their, you know, pearls of wisdom, right? Yeah. But, 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 yeah, it shouldn't be a two-way thing, right? It needs to be, I'm researching you. It's not useful to you if they're just gonna come back with loads of questions for you. So it's about establishing the, 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 the rules of engagement, right? This is a research session. I'm gonna be asking you questions about this. Um, I pay people like $500 for an hour of their time, um, depending on who they are, right? Um, and you can find, um, you can you can find pe people in specific roles and specific companies through these platforms as well. So um, it depends. You, know, you have to think as well. There's always going to be a bit of bias as to why people are motivated to take part. That's that's just real. That's just real life. You know. Um, but uh, speaking to a few of them is going to raise the confidence and the responses that you get. Yeah. Any other questions about recruiting or paying people? Just be aware if you do insist on paying people in die or E, you're only going to get people who are happy with that, right? So just consider that. Also, I, I don't do that because um, uh, just on a logistics level, I couldn't get it financed to be able to work out how to receipt it properly. So just like, you can kind of receipt it and I'm thinking, God, whether you hate the company or not. Um, how many people? So you probably heard five is the magic number for users, right? There's actually some science behind it, and it's uh, but it's quoted incorrectly. I'm not going to go into loads of detail about it now. Five is it's like how long is a piece of string? Five is a good number to start with per user type, right? It's not just five one one DAP developer, one crypto trader, one uh, asset manager. You need to do five of each of those, right, to understand the themes and patterns, okay? Um, but you really do it enough that you stop learning, right? No users, no insights. One user, loads of insights. Two users, not twice the insights, because there's probably gonna be some overlap between them. So you're gonna get diminishing returns. And uh, I'm working on a study at the minute about uh, DeFi users, people using Maker and Compound and things like that. And we've got to about 12, and now I'm not learning anything new, right? So that's really a good indicator that I can stop now, formulate these insights, and re uh, make the recommendations to the business. Um, and it's about um, doing this little and often. So if you imagine that your company is like a ship, right? You've got your endpoint at, uh, in sight or on the map, right? But you need this constant course correction. It's much, much better to do a few users often than it is like 20 user study at the start and then never doing it again, right? Because you'll probably be well off course by the time that you get to launch your product. So just doing a little bit often helps correct and gives the people kind of purpose and alignment around what they should be building to. Any questions on numbers? Cool. Okay, so the setup. Right, we've just done it in, in person. You can do it in person, that's great. There's pros and cons for both of these things. So I do most of my by video call. The reason is that like, we're a distributed company, I work from my home, um, and uh, sometimes I get like Sasha, Sasha will dial in with her camera off, you know, and sound off, and she'll be the observer, right? And I'll explain to the user, I've got my colleague Sasha on the call, she's just taking notes for me, and so it's not a distraction having like loads of faces popping up, right? So make sure the video's off, yes? So why would you have a second person in the call if you're already recording it? Um, I challenge you to go and re-watch your videos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm consuming them, right? Yeah. 
it's very time consuming. Most people no, no, don't I mean, watch videos. I mean, like, because it doubles my time. So I do the interview, and then I would have to watch the interview again to no, make I all the see. notes. Yeah. But there's a second person is watching it. So if you do it asynchronous, it's also like and people don't watch up. People just don't watch the videos. The, I, I know what you're saying. Some people might. Some people might. In my experience, I, you know, the CEO is like really interested and wants to do it. Send them links. They don't. Oh, they don't watch the videos. Right. So the video is there as an um, artifact for me to rely on in case we fucked it up. Right. In case I can go back and go, what the hell were they saying when I, my notes don't make any sense in this part? I can go back to that. You might make like a highlights reel for people if you really want to do that. That's quite. That's very time consuming, but also very powerful as well. I have another reason. Uh -huh. The observer will behave differently when he knows it is live, rather than it is recorded. Absolutely, they pay attention, yeah. right? So when, when you're watching a video, are you only ever just watching a video? You're on Slack, your email, texting, whatever, right? The observer has to pay attention, exactly, right, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's some trade, there are some positives to doing video calls as well, because it requires less, less of the user to take part. They can do it in a time and place that suits them, you know, they book in with you and, um, uh, it, it's it's easier for them to take part. If you require them to be in a location, you have to pay them loads more money to turn up. And also there are some problems with inviting them to your office. So let's say you work at a really cool tech company, you've got like, it's all like really cool post-it notes everywhere and like cool furniture and stuff. That can all influence the user's perspective of your brand and your company. I've used like uh, like uh, you can book, book like meeting rooms by the hour in like anonymous sort of places. I've done that before. Meet them in like a coffee shop, I guess, as long as it's quiet enough for you to have a conversation without it being too disruptive. That can work as well. But video calls they work, and we work, you know we've got global audiences, global customers, right? So um, the days of the usability lab are well over, right? That's an old school um, approach to doing testing and interviews. We don't need those anymore. There's better ways to do this that's much, much cheaper, and it's doing this. So, question, well, there's a difference, though, between doing usability testing or very structured sequence, and you're also your eye tracking, and you're seeing where, what button they're looking at before they click. That would be the old school usability yeah. microscope, compared to this is more subjective fluid interactive dialogue is that correct yeah so we're focusing more on the on the dialogue element but um i have a you know eye tracking looks cool uh but i that tells you what not why right so eye tracking says oh the user looked at that then they looked at that then they looked at that but you need to ask them questions to elicit the why behind it so you still need all that other stuff uh, i personally uh not a fan of some of those things. I did the um, neuromarketing course at UCL in London uh, around this, where uh, there's like movements into, you know, like putting like like putting people through MRI scanners and stuff to try and understand their brains and their behaviours. And it's still guess it's guesswork at this stage. It's just, um, uh, you know, I went on the course and they were like, yeah, to be honest, just interview somebody and you'll get get the same insights. So it's yeah, but no. I mean, there was a place for usability studies because there was an easier technology to do it. So it's a trade-off, right? You might get the most in-depth usability report possible in a lab, right? But is that worth it than just doing, you know, a few users often? There's a trade-off, I think, to balance. Yeah, just one kind of sure. comment is, uh, I, you know, I've been both, I've worked in user experience design and you know, product management and so on, but I've also uh, been a stealth subject for a big software company as I was, a, I was the guinea pig. I went into the usability lab, people with the white coats and so on. Yeah, it's scary. And, and uh, I went through a sequence and I did my little thing and then, you know, said goodbye. Their product was horrible <laughs> later on. You know, I saw it a year later and it was just awful. So, uh, I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, th this is that over-reliance on technique and science and software thing. If we put eye tracker on, they will know what's going on in their brains. 
it's not necessarily true. You know, it's just have, being able to have the be able to ask these questions as well. You had a question. Yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, in, in, instead of using eye tracking, how do you feel about things like, uh, uh, for example, Hotjar that yeah. makes heat maps and like follows mouse uh, movements? Mm. Uh, well, um, so a couple of things. Firstly, with Hotjar, you need users. Yes, so sure. you need, as it no no, as in not like a user test, you actually need a large sample of people to be doing it. So one of the problems with that is that if you're early in the crypto space, you may not have many users, in which case you're just not going to get a lot of insights out of it. Basically the same problem as Google Analytics using that in your platform. Well, I kind of um, disagree with that because you can have a, a session recording because okay. he's watching one session, mm -hmm. which is extremely useful to do. So you have like basically one user going to a flow mm -hmm. and then seeing how they do things. And if you watch like 10, like 20 sessions, you get a better feeling of how people are. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the real benefit of that is that those are real people doing real things yes. on your site. It's not a made up user test, right? That is absolutely beneficial. The only thing I would say is it needs supplementing because it's still yeah, of course. what. It's yeah, still the what are they doing, not the why. Yeah, sure. but absolutely, I agree. Um, the, the question is, you know, because you don't understand their context, you don't know what else is going on in their life. You know, I've watched some of those videos, and then then they're, they're not doing anything for a while. What are they doing? They go yeah. to the toilet. Are they like, uh, you know, what what what's going on in that time, right? Yeah. You don't know why they make pauses when they do, yeah. and why they click on things that they do, or what they're looking for when they start. Um, but they can be interesting. Um, I I think. This is like that's quant data, right? And or uh, elements of it. it sort of bridges the, the. It's like you can dive into that data to see a, a, the granular level, but also as a collection. Um, I think um, all successful companies need to do both of those things. Yeah, and yeah, you, you discover behavior patterns, yeah. which is cool. But they are like starting points for your research. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. They, you can you can make your assumptions based yeah. on that information, yeah. right? You're like, oh, everyone goes to this page and then they do this thing. That's weird. Yeah. I wonder why they do that, and then go and find out. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's room for both for sure. Um, so the last thing is about uh, a couple more things is uh, video conferencing, right? So we use Zoom. The amount of time Zoom is generally easy, but the amount of times that I've had a session where the end user has not been able to use the software that you've demanded that they use, right? Is uh, like, it's it's just ask them what's easiest for them and you do that, right? It's gonna be easier for you to set it up at your end to make sure that the, the, the you don't spend the first half of the interview helping them work out where the share button is, right? So um, this is quite a good tip is just to, to do go where they are in terms of the software, the tool that you use. Uh, record it, but do always ask permission beforehand. So this comes to the, it's really beneficial to record it so you can come back, right? Don't just ask them at the start of the session, oh, by the way, I'm recording it. Ask them, like, when you're recruiting them, okay? Because then they'll always say yes. If you land it on them last minute, then um, people don't like being surprised about that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a good idea not to just, yeah, land it on them like that. Um, you might have consent forms or NDAs, that's down to you as a company. I mean, I think some companies really overhype their own, the, 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 you know, the information that they think they're going to be sharing with this, the user, right? I mean, you're asking the user a load of questions, hopefully you're probably not going to tell them loads of stuff that you're doing if it's secret, right? So. Just like, it's maybe a bit heavy handed in, in some contexts. Some companies insist on it, speak to your legal team if that's the case. Uh, I, most of the projects I work on, we don't use NDAs. Um, so the last bit, we're nearly done, I think. Yeah, so it's just about making sense of the findings, right? So you've got all these patterns and themes now um, that are coming out. Uh, you're gonna create recommendations and actions. So you're going to come up with Oh, I think we should be doing this. That's a, and it's good to do this as a team as well. But um, what you need to do is prioritize them because you like, especially if this is your first research project. You know, it's like low hanging fruit. You're going to find out loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff you want to do or change about your product. In which case, it's worth plotting it on something like this. So this uh, x-axis is like technical difficulty, and up there, user value or revenue. Um, so what you can do with your recommendations is, as a team, decide where, in what quadrant 
the recommendation goes, right? So if it's low technical difficulty, but really high user value or revenue, it's in the top left, easy and important. Those are maybe the things you should work on first. Stuff that's high technical difficulty and um, high value, important, but it's big, so maybe work on that in the background. And you've got stuff that's low value and low technical difficulty, not important to be working on that can wait a bit. And then you can go to uh, the CEO who's been demanding this feature here in the high technical um, difficulty, low user value and say, look, we've plotted it, it's not worth doing, right? So let's focus on the top left things. Um, so it, this is just, it's really simple, it's an activity you can do in like an hour from the research that you've done and it starts getting all the team right going, all right, that's the stuff we're going to focus on. You can even do it in that session, who's going to work on what, create your tickets for it, right, for, for whatever you're doing. Um, so it's, it's not rocket science, it's just getting to this point and remember that it's not, um, uh, it's not certainty, it's always about course correction. Okay, you, you're going to have new assumptions and new hypotheses that come out of the research that you've just done. Like, oh God, we haven't even thought of this. Now we need to explore this too. Research usually leads to more research. But, I mean, I, I like that, personally. Yes. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so um, we've got like 10 minutes left. Um, the couple, last thing I just want to do is just give you some, what we recommend as great books. So the first one, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow is all about um, cognitive uh, behavioral science, the cognitive biases that we have, and why people do the things that they do. If you can, um, if you can uh, read this, then you'll hopefully have a slightly better understanding of how people respond to your product and you as a person and how you respond to the world. Um, the book in the middle um, is an excellent resource for um, learning to do UX research, especially if you don't have a researcher. And it's really simple, it's easy to read, it's quite entertaining, and I recommend it. And then Steve Portugal's interviewing users is more detailed about um, uncovering insights through interviewing people and techniques. And the very last thing is, we need participants for consensus research studies. <laughs> you get paid. Um, so if you fit any of the following criteria at all, Please email designresearch at consensus.net or scan the QR code, it'll take you to it. Uh, it's really important that we get out of our bubbles. Okay, I guess this is sort of a bubble at DevCon. Um, but this is the most bubbly it gets. Um, but you know, we're specifically looking for people in like this region or who are DeFi users or who are DAP developers. You don't have to be all three of these things, right? Just any of them. Uh, drop us an email. Um, and that would be really good. So I think we can maybe just take some um, questions in the last couple of minutes if anyone has any. Are you going to share this slide? This one? Maybe that. The whole deck? Mm -hmm. um, we can do, but I don't know how, what the method is for that. Uh, maybe ask the email. <laughs> sure. If you, want, yeah, if you want to copy, then yeah. So, uh, yeah, again, based on your experience, and uh, well, I've been working in Web2 quite a lot and mainly in Web3. And um, in your experience, what's different based on the old research methods that you can uh, you see specifically for Web3? Do you see a difference or do, do you see any nuances? Uh, I can go first and then you, yeah. So, uh, my personally, um, uh, no, I think the attitude, <laughs> the attitude <laughs> The attitude from the, from the teams is different, but the techniques are the same, the, you, the people might be the same as well, and we don't need to reinvent everything that we do, right? There are some tried and tested things that work, all, technical com all big tech companies are doing this, so I, what my experience is, and that's why we're doing this workshop here, is we've seen lots of crypto blockchain teams um, just not not be down to trying doing this because it's not in their wheelhouse, they haven't had experience doing it before and they're of the assumption that it's blockchain, it's so brand new, no one knows what they need so there's no point in asking them, right? And that comes to that this problem where, where I know teams who've been building things for two years and haven't found a use case for it, right? 
What a waste of money and effort and time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thanks. Yes. Uh, what, uh, do you have anything to add? I mean, first of all, thank you. Great, great yeah, talk. Yeah. Um, do you think it, it is it is still viable to conduct uh, user research uh, in a late stage of the product lifecycle? Yes, absolutely. So um, we're encouraging you to do it early, but it's to to like. I guess better late than never, right? And and also, um, we you know in a what's it products with like really big um, users that are turning over two hundred million a year, but, and we do testing all the time there. But too. there is there is one big challenge. You you need to you, there's a lot of friction with project managers, with developers, mm -hmm. with all those type of people. What is the best way you could convince the team that? we really need to do that user research. I mean, how, how to ease that? Yeah, it's a bad use for them. <laughs> the first time is difficult. I, I Yeah, because people are, like we talked about in the biases, people are resistant to hearing feedback, or they, they, they're not quite sure how it works and what they're going to get out of it. Um, my advice is definitely to include them. Don't just do it on the side, because that's going to make you look like you don't trust any of their opinions, right? And then you're just going off and doing some secret research, and then you're like, ta -da, I spoke to these users, and they're like, fuck you. So um, that's not a good approach. Um, this book, the one in the middle, addresses this exactly, right? It's got like, the, you can get this free online, it's, it's like an EPUB version, right? Um, but buy the book, um, and um, <laughs> he's. Uh, it, it's also about getting buy-in. Absolutely, um, the most compelling experiences that I've seen are insisting that the person who has to, who is resistant to research, observes all the sessions. Right. Get them. Don't rely on them to watch any video. They won't watch the videos. Right. Get. You're the observer. Come and sit in the here. And once they start hearing from people, and they can't butt in. They're not allowed to say anything during the session. They're just going to be like, okay, right. We need to do more of this. Right. Uh, but it's getting to that point, which is tricky. Um, we're hoping that by you know what what in consensus design, there's quite a few researchers. We're trying to do this with all companies. So a lot. I like to, I do like a little bit of like, I go and talk to, I've spoken to Gnosis before about doing research um, to help them understand like some of the benefits of doing it, although they're already doing it, so that's good. Um, so it's just about um, education in the industry. And I think a lot of, sorry to interrupt, I think a lot of teams are, you know, lots of people made lots of money in ICOs and it's got nothing to do with their ability to run a company. And as a result, don't necessarily ask the right questions. So I'd like to add to that. I've seen a lot of companies where, first of all, the vision is not clear, then the strategy, like the, the main key objective, or kind of the main key challenge, or kind of tackles are not clear. The strategy, how to get there, and then if you go further and further, then like use cases are also like non-existent. Yeah. But we're building very cool technology. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool, but cool isn't a but reason really, to build things. So I've worked like, some of those companies. I've seen this happening like around me now. You also during this conference a lot, and I feel it also has to do a bit with the immaturity of like the immaturity of a lot of people. Exactly. Yeah. Which we should... totally makes sense to me because a lot there's a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So well, we're gonna I'm gonna we're gonna create a consensus academy like modules on doing user research that we're gonna try and get out there in front yeah. of people. So. So they can just um, try and develop these skills themselves. Yeah. And actually, as a UX researcher, as a UX researcher, your job also is to educate people yeah, and educate your team and yeah, tell sure. them why it's so important. So you can yeah. pass the message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to double down on one point. So you, you, you said if you have a resistant or a resisting uh, team member, you can put him to start as an observer. Yeah. yeah. So this observer is like the most comfortable position among the three. The exactly. Yeah. They don't have to do anything except take notes. Okay. And then just listen and take notes, yeah. So but it's... Uh, that is also very difficult to do well. True. No. Yeah. Yeah. Advice on note-taking is yeah. when in doubt, <laughs> write everything. Yeah. Right? Just write it all down, every single thing that's said. Because yeah. then you can interpret it later. Yeah, <laughs> take raw data. Just take raw data afterwards. You interpret it. It's like verbatim. Yeah. 
but after positioning them in observer, do they do they turn? Do they like ease? Like at the at the beginning, they they are very resistant, but after being an observers, they they change. It's not yeah. the recipe. <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly. You have to see. Yeah, my my advice is to get them to listen to two or more. Because one of the things that they they can do is just latch on to that one user that they have heard and go right. We need to change everything, right? Because they're like it's a really good session and that user was really um, verbose. But but of course that's not user research. You need to speak to a few people. So just like more than one. And bear in mind the confirmation bias. They might launch to what they want to hear and show you. Oh, do you remember that user? He said it's okay. No. <laughs> I mean, you know, at least getting them to listen to users yeah. as a start, right? Even if they're hearing what they want to hear, I think yeah. it's a really good start to get them interested in using and doing the sessions too. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, a big learning for me in this conference, which hasn't been as this is my first consensus, um, but maybe in other crypto conferences, um, the, the audience has been a little bit broader. Um, particularly when it comes to DeFi, a learning for me is. We're actually not building for the people in this room, even though a lot of people think we are. What's your what works for you guys in terms of like finding new people around themes, like general consumers that might be morally in favor of the you know using products that do X, Y, and Z as opposed to others mm -hmm. or um, like recruiting people around themes really. Yeah. So you can, I, I can understand like income groups. Ignore demographics. Demographics are not a, a, a really overrated. They're, they're proxies for, for what you're, you're actually interested in. Who cares how old that person is, right? And you know how much their household income is if they are behaving in the way that you're trying to find, right? So in, in like platforms like this or with any recruitment, you use a screener. A screen a series of questions to determine whether they are the right person for you. So, for example, if I was finding uh, DeFi users, this is an example, finding uh, people who use MakerDAO and stuff like that, I asked them first of all, do you do you have cryptocurrency? Yes or no? Like, get, like kind of starting broad, getting more specific, just as as you do in the interview itself, and then like, uh, what coins do you hold? Allow them to like type them all in, so so you can tell whether it sounds like they do know what they're talking about or not. And then like, which of these things have you used before? A long list of all kinds of different DApps, and there are the DeFi products in there, and they have to have selected one of those in order to qualify for the research. So that's the behavior. The behavior is: have they done this thing in the last six months? That's what I care about. I don't care how old they are, you know, or what city they live in. Um, that's not really very useful information for, for you, yeah. Anything else? Well, one, uh, one thing is an issue is, um, you know, I think user research is great, primary source, understanding the why, digging down, but also, you know, there's the ongoing analytics, the runtime analytics, and you need both, so my, yes. I think that's often you know, both well, equally valuable. The question is, how do you work with that to function? Mm -hmm. Is that a separate function? Or, you know, what's, yeah. how do you call Yeah, it? in lots of companies it's totally siloed, right? And that's really frustrating. I had to build relationships with the data analytics teams in other companies I've worked at. Probably if you're, probably you're on a smallish team, that it's not such a problem to be able to reach out to that person. But we should be working together um, I don't really see why why that hasn't been the case. Uh, probably if you're working in crypto, well, it depends on what your product is. If it's a brand new product you haven't launched yet, you probably don't have analytics about it anyway. But 100%, uh, they need to be working together. You need to inform your assumptions, your hypotheses from that, um, you know, from, from, from what you're seeing in where people, what countries people are visiting from, and you know where they click, and how often um, their dwell time on, on things like that, uh, or things like Hotjar as well, and they can help form your hypothesis. But it won't tell you what the intrinsic need is of the user, which is the thing you can improve on to, to you can build on to improve your product. Okay. Um, yeah, just drop us um, just uh, drop us an email if you're interested in taking part in research. Come and talk to me afterwards uh, if you like. I'm only around for now because I've got a fly to avoid uh, typhoons. Um, <laughs>